Okay, let's go ahead and go through chapter seven service processes. Basically, we're going to have kind of three objectives that we're trying to get to in this chapter. We're just going to be talking about some of the basics of service processes and understanding some of the measures that we use to look at service processes. So we're going to analyze some simple services and we're going to understand a waiting line analysis. Okay. Uh, we also have, again, just conceptually, we have these service package, which are we've identified as five components, right? The service bundle consists of supporting facility, facilitating goods, information, explicit services, and implicit services. The supporting facility, if we think about Murray State, is like the buildings that are here, right? If we didn't have the buildings, we couldn't deliver the service or the education that we're providing. The facilitating goods are the materials purchased by the consumer or provided by the customer. Think about your textbooks, right? Uh, information, operations data or information that's provided to the customer to enable efficient and customized services. Okay, examples include if it's a golf course, tee off times, maybe weather reports, medical records, right, that type of information. Explicit services are where the benefits are readily observable by the senses and that consist of essential or intrinsic features of the service. So examples might be things like the response time of an ambulance, the air conditioning in a hotel room, and a smooth running car. Implicit services are those that are not readily observable by the senses and maybe not a consistent part of the service. So again, you might have psychological benefits that the customer may sense only vaguely or the extrinsic features of the service. Examples are the status of a degree from an Ivy League school and the privacy of a loan office and a worry-free auto repair, right? So those are gonna be the five components of a service bundle, right? When we classify services, we're often thinking about classifying them in terms of customer contact. What's the physical presence of the customer in the system, right? When the customer is, has a high degree of presence in the system, it complicates things. It complicates the management of that service, right? And so the creation of the service, again, the work process involved in pro providing the service itself is entwined with the customer contact. Okay, so things about services, right? We, we had this earlier in the semester, but just a little bit of a refresher. Services cannot be stored, right? They're intangible. In services, capacity becomes the do dominant issue because we can't store the service. Too much capacity leads to excess costs, too little leads to lost customers. So what we're trying to do when we manage services is find that sweet spot. How do we provide enough service that we don't lose customers, okay? Waiting, and we can not just lose customers, but have satisfied customers. And so waiting line models help us do that, right? And so this uh, design, or this, excuse me, this slide is packed full of information, right? We're looking at kind of these uh, different potential types of service processes. And, um, when we look at those, we're looking at the degree of customer contact or server contact, how much are they engaging, right? And all the way down here at the bottom, we have low customer contact, but high production efficiency when we mail things, because again, the customer is not involved in that process at all. And we're talking about efficiency in terms of the server's efficiency, not maybe whether or not mail contact is the right way to go, but how efficient What's the production efficiency of that server, right? But there's also low sales opportunities here because we're not engaging with the customer. We can move up this scale, right? All the way to face-to-face -face and total customization. Your book spends a little bit of time talking about these three areas of degree of customer server contact, the buffered core where there's no contact with the customer and the server, the permeable system where there is some contact with the customer and the server, and the reactive, reactive system in, in terms of where the customer and the server are highly engaged with one another. And again, we can see production efficiency becomes lower the more the customer is involved, but the sales opportunities become higher, right? So when we manage services, we have to think about these trade-offs and figure out what's the best approach for our particular type of service. And this slide just takes that a little bit further to say, okay, well, I can look at my worker requirements when I have a low degree of customer contact, 
like the mail system, right? It's clerical skills, paper handling, and office automation, all the way up to a high degree has diagnostic skills, client mix and client worker teams are where we're looking for that technological innovation. Think like medical operations here or attorneys or accounting, right? Where we have to have that kind of uh, diagnostic um, set and that, you know, the clients can be, have this wide variety of needs. And so interspersing that client mix might be the right approach or maybe specializing and having special teams. So again, there's again, this range of customer contact. And again, what our workers are required to do ranges along with that. Okay. We also have virtual services now, which is not something we talked about 20 years ago. Uh, virtu a pure virtual customer contact, companies enable customers to interact with one another in an open environment like eBay or Second Life. In a mixed virtual and actual customer, uh, customer contact, customers interact with one another in a server moderated environment, such as product discussion groups. You can do that on YouTube or in Wikipedia, right? The, the, um, the customers are actually helping create that content. Okay, in manufacturing, we talk about process flow charts. In services, same type of thing, but we talk about service blueprinting, okay? Uh, a unique feature of the service blueprint is that we make this distinction between the zone where we have high customer contact and the aspects of the service that are related to that versus those aspects where the customer doesn't see the server, okay? And we draw that with a line of visibility on the flowchart. okay? We use these service blueprints to try to identify areas where we need to fail safe our operation. So how can we help prevent mistakes from becoming defects? And we use a tool called creating poke yokes, right? It's a procedure that blocks the inevitable mistake from something becoming a service defect. Poke yoke, I think is the Japanese word loosely interpreted as avoid mistakes. Okay. We use POCO yokes a lot in factories, right? We have a go, no go gauge, right? That's an example of it. Um, in services, right, we have other ways to do that. We might have warnings, we might have physical or visual contact methods. Um, so maybe parts can only fit together in the correct way. And when we look for poke yokes, when we look for those opportunities, we're looking at the task that to be done. We're looking at the treatment that we want our customer to have and the tangible features that uh, from the service facility. So here's an example of a service blueprint, okay? And so up here, we've got our first fa failure opportunity. Customer forgets the need for service. We send an automatic reminder with a 5% discount a possible failure. Customer has difficulty commu communicating the problem. A possible fix, we have a joint inspection, okay? Possible failure, customer arrival is not noticed. We use a belt uh, chain to signal arrivals. Possible failure, incorrect diagnosis of the problem, pokey yoke. We have high-tech checklists such as expert systems and diagnostic equipment. Right. So this is a uh, service blueprint that comes from, I think it's exhibit 7-4 in your text, um, but that's just some examples of what a service blueprint looks like. And again, here's the line of visibility, and you can see we've got the customer here, they're calling in, so they're not seeing the person that they're talking to. We set up an appointment the customer arrives, someone greets the customer. They're actually seeing this person. They get the vehicle information, right? The customer specifies the problem. And we have this kind of decision-making, is the cause clear, right? If no, we have detailed problem diagnosis. If yes, right, then we just move on to prepare cost and time estimate and we get that back to the customer, okay? When we talk about waiting lines and queues, <clears throat> we really are looking at, the arrivals of our customers and the average time it takes us to serve the customer, right? So a central problem in service settings is how we manage waiting time. Reducing waiting time costs money, right? But we can raise customer satisfaction and throughput. When people 
weighting our employees, right? We can value their time because we know how much we're paying them per hour. When people waiting our customers, it's more difficult to value their time. Lost sales is a difficult thing to analyze. Now, I've seen some statistics on folks that have like 1-800 numbers where you call in to purchase, and they can, in that system, get the data that says when customers wait this long, here's their average purchase. And when they wait longer, what is their average purchase? And so they are able to quantify what the, that value is of losing sales because people have to wait. So arrivals and service profiles. Arrivals often vary greatly over a time period. Like if you look at an airport, when do people arrive, right? Relative, you know, six o'clock in the morning, pretty low pace, right? Two o'clock in the afternoon, usually pretty busy. Unless it's Paducah, then it's six o'clock in the morning is really busy and noon it's not, right? All right, so then we have our service requirements and our normal capacity is here, but we obviously are gonna have a couple of times where our arrivals exceed our capacity. So things that we think about or consider when we think about our waiting lines or queues is, is what they're also called, right? We're interested in the number of arrivals over the hours that the service system is open. We're interested in uh, how much does customer demand vary um, in terms of the amounts of service that are needed. How often does it exceed our normal capacity? Uh, can we control arrivals? Can we do something like short lines? And we talk about that like, you know, before we had all of the self checkout, you could have a register line for people with 10 items or less at the grocery store, right? Or do we have specific hours for specific customers? You know, do we run specials to try to draw people in at off peak hours, right? We can affect service time by using faster or slower servers as well. Uh, when we manage our queues, how do we make our customers feel better about the fact that they have to wait? Or how do we improve that? Maybe we segment the customers, right? If I have people that have needs that are relatively easy to resolve, they go through one set of um, lines. And if I have people that have more complex problems or service needs, they go through another set train your servers to be friendly. Think about how you feel when somebody smiles and is friendly as opposed to when you have a crabby server, right? Uh, that tends to make you not appreciate the service as much. Um, tell your customers what to expect. I always use the Olive Garden example. I can't tell you the last time I went to an Olive Garden and they told me my wait time and it exceeded the amount of time they told me, right? That way they set me up to think it's going to be 20 minutes. And then when they get me in in 10, I think, oh, that's awesome. They got me in in 10 minutes, right? Um, and then you can try to divert your customer's attention. Think about doctor's offices, right? They always have TVs, magazines, toys for kids, right? Those are ways to keep people occupied while you're waiting. Encourage your customers to come during Slack periods, right? Um, either via appointment scheduling or by offering some special bonus if they come at a particular time. But there's lots of ways to manage our customer arrivals, okay? So when we quantify our queuing system concerns, right? We have several things that we have to think about. I'm gonna explain these kind of variables and, but I don't want you to get hung up on being super stressed about not understanding the, the really detailed, finely nuanced differences between exponential Poisson and constant, because we will typically give you whether it is exponential Poisson or constant, all right? But those are kind of three options in terms of customer arrival rates. Okay, and I have some more slides on that. Is our population size finite or infinite, right? Do I have just a select number of people who can come into the service or is it infinite? Okay, so example, um, <clears throat> the McDonald's, especially when they had one service line, they maybe only had room for 10 cars. And once they hit 12 cars or 11 cars, the 11th car was out on 641. So they could no longer get in line. That's a finite service system. Okay, infinite says that basically I have enough capacity for people to get in line that I am never going to exceed it. And anybody who wants to get in line can. Okay, customer arrival characteristics, is it steady or is it seasonal, right? 
Uh, what's the size or the arrival rates? Do they come as an individual or as a group or some, some mix of that? What's their degree of patience? Are they willing to get in line and wait? Or are they going to uh, not get in line? Or are they going to get in line and then leave, right? So, um, and then what's our service rate distribution? Everything that we're going to look at is going to be an exponential service rate. All right. So when we look at this queuing system, right, think of the service system from the time the customer gets in line till the time after they're served till when they exit the process. That is the service system. Okay. And so we're interested in these factors, right? The length of line, is it infinite or limited? Infinite or finite, right? We talked about that. How many lines are there? Is it a single line or a multiple line? Think Wendy's, where you walk in and you have one line that chains around, or think multiple McDonald's, right? When you walk in and there's multiple, at least that was the way it was. I haven't been in for a while, but you used to just walk in and kind of pick a register to get in line behind. Okay. And what's your queue discipline? Are you first come, first serve? Do you look for people with the shortest processing time and serve them? Do you take your reservations first? Is it emergencies first? Is it some type of limited needs first? Or are there some other things that you consider in terms of Q discipline? But Q discipline generally is the priority rule or set of rules that determine the order of service for customers who are in, who are waiting in line. Arrival distributions, right? Who have exponential describes the probability that the next arrival will happen within a specified period of time. All right, this is what I don't want you to get hung up on because I'm not going to ask you to calculate that. Basically, I just want you to understand that there are differences between the types of arrival distributions that we're going to be talking about, and we need to be aware of that to make sure we're using the correct formulas. Okay, we can have a Poisson distribution, which describes the number of, of arrivals during a period of time. Okay, so let's compare that again real quick. Exponential is... Um, describing the time between occurrences of successive events because time flows continuously. So it's the time between services, okay? Poisson, on the other hand, is the number of occurrences that we are looking at in a fixed period of time, okay? And again, we're not gonna get super hung up on this because we're not gonna have you dive deep into this type of math, right? Customer arrival factors, right? We have to be concerned with the distribution. Is it constant, exponential, or Poisson, or some other type? Is the pattern of customer arrivals controllable or uncontrollable? Do they arrive as a single unit or a batch, right? And what's their degree of patience? Do they get in line and stay? Are they impatient? They arrive and leave, which is called balking, or do they arrive, wait a while, and then leave, which is called reneging, okay? So that's, again, a pretty good summary of our customer arrival factors. Things that we think about within the system itself, right? How much waiting room is available? What's the length of the queue? How many servers are actually working? How many lines do we have open? What's our queue discipline, right? How are, are we first come, first serve? Remember that set that we just went through? What's our service time distribution? What is the service rate and how much does it vary, okay? We also need to think about line structure. So what does the process look like? Is it single channel, single phase, single channel, multi-phase, multi-channel, single phase, multi-channel, multi-phase, or mixed? I bet you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Let me just do a quick, do I have a visual? I don't have a visual on that. Um, what I want you to do is look at, um, in your text, there is a good visual on that on the upper right hand page of, I'm sorry, exhibit 7.10, the line structures, right? But I can, um, yeah, what I can do is just do a quick description. Think single channel, single phase. Think a one, one person barbershop, right? You get in, you go in, you get in line and one person serves you. Single channel, multi-phase. Think um, like great clips. You walk in, you put your name on a list, but there are, no, single channel multi-phase is going to be like a car wash. You get in line and they do multiple things in a sequence. So 
you know, you get in line, you're the one person, you're the car in line, the automated car wash hooks your tire and it pulls you through, it washes you, it uh, scrubs your car, it rinses your car off, it dries it, right? That's single channel multi-phase. You're one line, but you're doing that same, you're doing multiple steps. Uh, multi-channel multi-phase, an example of that is um, <clears throat> you can have uh, bank tellers, right? And you go get in line and um, then basically you go to a different, you know, you can have multiple, uh, multiple lines and they can do maybe just one operation, right? Or you're going to have multiple lines and then they do multiple things in the service operation. So think about for that one, think about the admission of patients into a hospital. You go to the emergency room, you wait, then you see the person that registers you. Then you wait and then you get into an emergency room and you see the nurse. And then you wait and you see the doctor, unless it's a serious emergency where they get to you right away. Or then we can have some kind of mixture of those. But I think that gives you a pretty good idea of the different types of line structure that we might see. Okay. Our service time distribution, we can say it's either constant, so it's automated, we don't customize it, or it's variable, right? Service is provided by humans, we can't, we can customize it to individuals, um, and it can be uh, described using exponential distribution. So it's either constant or variable slash exponential distribution. And then on the, in our service system, the exiting the system, right? Do customers that exit the system, do they have a low probability of re-entering the system or a high probability of re-entering the system? Okay, so if we think about um, appendectomy patients, they're probably not going to return for another operation. Uh, if we have, if our machines, right, are subject to breakdowns, right, they may require uh, immediate service right after uh, they leave the service system. Okay, in this chapter, we're just going to talk about these three basic models, a simple system, a, contact, a constant service time system, and a multi-channel system. And what happens is we look at these criteria that we just reviewed, and depending on the answers to is it what type of service phase is it, okay, we're just going to look at single here. What's the layout? Is it single channel or multi-channel? What's the population? Is it infinite or finite? Well, we're only going to look at infinite. What's the arrival pattern? We've, we're only going to look at Poisson. What's the Q discipline? We're only going to look at first come, first serve. What's the service pattern? Exponential or constant, right? And what's the permissible Q length? Um, is it unlimited? Okay. So examples of a simple system, drive and teller at the bank, one lane toll bridge. Right. Constant service system, the roller coaster ride, right? It goes off every so many minutes. Okay. Multi channel, multi, multi channel system, parts counter in an auto agency. All right. In order to understand the formulas, we have to understand the variables and we have to get comfortable with our Greek alphabet. Okay. Lambda is arrival rate, mu is service rate. One over mu is the average service time. Okay, so if my service rate is five minutes, my average service time is one customer every five minutes. If my arrival rate is, is three minutes, my average time between arrivals is one every three minutes, right? Rho is the ratio of total arrival time to service rate, okay? So what's my service utilization is basically what we're saying here. L sub Q is how many people are waiting in my queue or my line. L sub S is how many people or how many uh, customers or how many units are waiting in the system. W sub Q, I like to think of it as people. It's just easier for me to think of this as people. W sub Q is the average time that a person spends in the waiting line. W sub S is the average time that a person spends in the system. N is the number of units that are in the total system. S is the number of service channels. And then P sub N is the probability of exactly N units in the system. And P sub W is the probability of waiting in line. Okay, so those are our variables. And then we use the combination of these models 
and these variables to come up with our formulas to say, if I'm going to calculate how many people are waiting in line, this is my formula in model one, this is my formula in model two, and this is my formula in model three. We're not going to get super complicated in terms of using these, but I wanted you to be aware of where <coughs> of where the formulas are, and you can see that they're just slightly different between each of the models, right? And so again, L sub Q, how many people are in line? L sub S, how many people are in the system? W sub Q, how many people, what's the waiting time in, in line? W sub S, what's the, how long are people in the, the system, right? This is row, what's my service utilization? This is what's my probability of n number of people being in the system, okay? So example 7-1, Western National Bank is considering op opening a drive-through window. Management estimates that customers will arrive at a rate of 15 per hour, the okay? So my arrival rate, 15 per hour. My service rate, they can serve one every three minutes, so that's 20 per hour. Management would like to know utilization rate of the teller, that's row. Average number in the waiting line, that's L sub Q. Average number in the drive through system, that's L sub S. Average time in line, W sub Q. Average time in the system, W sub S. Okay. And what we need to know is that it also tells us that we're going to assume a Poisson arrival and exponential service. Okay. So let's come back here. With the Poisson arrival and exponential service, it can either be a simple system or a multi-channel system. We are not multi-channel. So we're going to use model one, a Poisson arrival and an exponential service pattern. If we were going to calculate these manually, these are the equations that we would use. And we know that we have our lambda and we have our mu because we were given our arrival rate and our service rate, right? And so to calculate those, Lambda is 15, mu is 20, so rho is 75%. Average number in line, L sub Q, lambda squared divided by mu times mu minus lambda, 2.25, right? And so you can see that we can get those formulas and then plug and play all of these different variables into those formulas, right? So the, the math here is not hard, right? It's understanding what the variables are asking for, and then applying the correct formula. The other part that's super cool is that there is this spreadsheet. And if you uh, go to, I think it's 7.4, practice what you learned, I've loaded this spreadsheet there. If you put in lambda of 15 and mu of 20, it's gonna calculate all of that for you. How awesome is that? right? So now I know rho 75%, right? How many people are, are waiting in line? 2.25. How many people are in the system? Three. What's my average waiting time? 0.15. Now this is of an hour because we're 15 people per hour and 20 per hour. Average time in the system? 0.2, right? Of an hour, right? So that being said, that is my lecture for chapter seven. I've also posted a YouTube recording that reviews the practice, the chapter seven practice homework. So uh, with that, you should be set and I'll see you soon.